Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Mark Newton from ML Newton Advisors. We're going to talk about the market that bit of a defensive mode today, bit of a, uh, a risk off phase with the S&P down almost 1%. Real estate and utilities in the top three of sectors with consumer discretionary in the middle financials pushing the way lower. We're going to talk about this market that's certainly been in transition and indigestion mode today, sort of the first day really potentially starting a move to the downside. Let's see what the charts tell us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the message of the markets. We focus on the charts to understand the dynamics of price, breadth, and sentiment, try to follow momentum, define trends, stay in trades, stay away from trades that are not working, and focus on uh, the actionable signals we can uh, we can understand from the market dynamics themselves. Overall, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, the market a bit in a distribution mode today. All is not that bad, though. The market's still uh, down only w uh, less than 1%, but it certainly started to show some of the signs of more of a defensive posturing. You know, up until now, it's been, which stocks do you own? Do you own o growth or do you own value? Do you own the technology, the leadership names, in tech and consumer, or do you go more to the cyclical sectors like industrials, materials, and financials? Today was a little more of a risk-off feel, right? With all 11 of the S&P sectors uh, finishing down for the day, financials pushing lower. But let's see if this is the beginning of something further or just a buyable dip among many buyable dips in 2021. We'll see what the charts say. We have some great content coming up uh, your way on this show uh, with our guest, uh, Mark Newton. Uh, what I'm excited to talk about next week on this show, on uh, Tuesday the 13th, we have Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. On Wednesday the 14th, Willie Delwich uh, from All Star Charts. All next week on Stock Charts TV, by the way, is charting the second half, our special mid-year outlook event. We're going to have special discussions every week on this show on Monday. On the final bar, I'll be providing sort of a brief market outlook for the second half of the year. And then it's going to be, we're going to unleash all sorts of great uh, experts, Tony Dwyer, uh, Gina Martin-Adams from Bloomberg, uh, Martin Pring sharing his latest thoughts, and, uh, and many, many more. Uh, go to charting the, uh, sorry, stockcharts.com slash charting the second half, that second 2ND, and you will, uh, you will find all the information, all the schedule for those events coming up. Let's get on to our market recap. As I mentioned earlier, a bit of a distribution today. So let's look at the charts together and see what's happened to, uh, to the short-term versus the long-term trends. So today, the S&P down about 0.8%. 5%, uh, closing just above 43.21. Uh, the NASDAQ down uh, a little bit less, 0.6% for the NASDAQ 100, mid caps and small caps, as usual in recent days, uh, closing down a little bit further. So we've seen that relative underperformance of small caps, underperformance of mid caps, no change in that uh, today as the market's moving lower. Fixed income uh, markets is where you're seeing uh, quite a bit of movement and 10-year uh, yields below one3 percent. I feel like we continue to define uh, the next uh, the next uh, 10 basis points lower and we continue to achieve that and continue to look lower. So 10 year yields pushing lower. That's the uh, bond price is moving higher with the TLT up about 0.4 percent today. And the dollar index, which has actually been in a pretty decent uh, upswing recently, is actually down 0.4 uh, percent using the UUP. Commodities overall mix. We've seen the long term uptrend in commodities and the DBC, our broad commodity ETF we tend to follow is up uh, just fine today. Gold actually flat for the day, but that came after a, uh, a little uh, afternoon bounce to recover some of the losses uh, from uh, earlier on in the day. And the long-term trend in gold overall has been relatively uh, choppy. It's been uh, threatened after a, a pullback in recent days. We talked about the bullish momentum divergence on the chart of gold uh, in yesterday's shows. Cryptocurrency uh, continue, cryptocurrencies continuing to show uh, relative weakness and uh, Bitcoin down about two and a half percent from yesterday. Ethereum, Ethereum about three times that uh, moving lower. Bitcoin currently around 33,000. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500 just talk about where we're at. So, you know, the trend line that we've had on this chart for months now has been taking the low from October 
uh, connecting that to the low in March. That lined up really well with the lows in May, lows in mid-June, and we violated that uh, for one day uh, here in mid-June, which was uh, which was when it uh, the market appeared to be sort of in a uh, a potential downtrend. That was when we talked about the uptrend being threatened, breaking down through the trend line for the first time. That was a one day move before we returned right back and closed back above the trend lines. We're right back there today. So we actually traded below but closed back above uh, that, uh, that trend line support today. So overall, that has been a great uh, sort of visual representation of the uptrend uh, in the S&P over the last eight months. I mean, my, my general base case, we remain above that trend line. Things are not that bad. And as much as we're seeing rotation, as much as we're seeing some stocks that have had good gains, giving some of that back recently, as long as we remain above that, the trend in the markets overall uh, is, uh, is healthy. If we do break that, you see some of the support levels that we've identified that we've discussed uh, before. The 50-day moving average currently around 42.20, just below that. And then I think the real support would be around 41.70. That's the swing lows from, uh, from early June and again in mid-June. As long as we remain above the 50-day, remain above that support, again, in a, in a pullback scenario, things are not that bad. It still sort of fits into the uh, sort of plain vanilla buyable pullback within a bull market phase. We start breaking that sort of level, then I would I would argue we need to start thinking about more about risk management, more about downside potential, more about protective uh, uh, posturing, and uh, and make sure you defend your portfolio against further downside movements. Let's look elsewhere in the movements uh, of the market today. Looking at the sector rotation, the number one sector today uh, uh, out of the eleven S and P sectors, real estate. Now all eleven of them uh, finished weaker today, but real estate. Uh, the least down of the of the bunch, followed by utilities and consumer staples. Uh, the bottom there in terms of the biggest uh, underperformers or the weakest performers of the financials really driving the way lower. And if you think about the relative performance of the financial sector, if you're owning financials here or if you're bullish on financials, you have to be, I, I would argue, uh, you, you should be expecting higher rates. You should be expecting a steepening yield curve because the relative strength of financials is essentially the shape of the yield curve. That's what it, it tracks very, very well. And really the 10-year yield is pretty close to that overall in terms of the general uh, configuration of that. So if you see the breakdown in yields, if you see that continuing lower, financials are going to have a lot of days, uh, most likely like you see today, down about 2%. Industrials and materials, uh, by the way, down, uh, down a little bit less, but still sort of the cyclical trade uh, struggling. You know, it's worth pointing out as we go around the, uh, the dashboard, and we, we use this every day in different, uh, in different uh, manners, and I try to uh, hopefully point out some of the ways that I'm using it just to nudge your thinking a little bit in terms of how to think of it. These panels below uh, the main market recap really show you some of the big movers, uh, and we're looking at it two different ways. Number one, we're looking at the scooter rankings. This is our proprietary stock charts technical ranking, doing a trend following analysis of all the uh, the large cap universe. And we have other universes uh, as well that you can switch to. But this is showing you which stocks in the large cap universe had the biggest gain in their scooter rankings today. So basically, which ones on a relative basis using that trend model, which ones have appreciated the, the most. And it's interesting, a lot of times you'll have things that are just in pretty good uptrends that are just extending those. But you also have something like Boeing, uh, which again, arguably, if you're looking for strong charts, I'm not sure Boeing is one of the examples I would probably bring up first, uh, because overall it's been relatively chart challenged, uh, not necessarily on an absolute basis, it's sort of been range bound, but on a relative basis, you can see it's been underperforming uh, really since mid-March, sort of that break to new swing highs in mid-March is where Boeing all of a sudden felt like it was really going to start accelerating to the upside, but that was the high water market. From there, it's been more of a uh, consolidation phase, but a bit of a bullish engulfing pattern. We have a big down uh, candle or down bar yesterday, an outside day or sort of a, uh, an increase where you open below yesterday's range, close back above it, and so potentially setting up for a bit uh, of an upside bounce. It's interesting that that's happening right as the RSI is right around 40, which is uh, in general in sort of a bull market phase. That's about where you'd find uh, a stock usually bottoming out if all is, uh, it's all as well. So it's a great way to sort of identify some of those names that may be on the move. And a lot of times when I'm looking for things that are, uh, that are rotating, uh, th things at inflection points, a lot of times that's a great way to, uh, to identify them. You know, also Biogen and the chart of Biogen really got skewed by uh, the news uh, in June that, that uh, caused it to spike up dramatically. But, and again, I'm often asked about how you use technical analysis in this sort of environment. And I, I would tell you, you know, regardless of what caused some of those sudden moves, whether it's earnings or a management change or a news flow, a, a drug trial, whatever it is that causes it, uh, at the end of the day, it still reflects the, you know, the, the summary or the, the aggregate supply and demand that comes together as buyers and sellers are agreeing on the price. You can't ignore the fact that 
there is a big spike higher. And now it's about what do you do uh, since then? What's interesting is we've potentially seen a short term bottom here in, in Biogen, all, even though the structure is still overall a little more negative. A move like today up uh, just under 4%, sort of potentially giving a bit of a, of a, a more of a bullish take on the chart. As always, I think the question with the chart like this is when you do have those short term uh, pullbacks, which you will, even if the trend overall remains positive, do those pullbacks keep making higher lows? And that would be something I would look for uh, as you do sort of digest today's gain if you get a bit of a pullback um, through the uh, through the end of the week into next week do we maintain a higher load we remain above the previous swing low that would be one thing I would certainly be uh, be looking for you know finally when we uh, just to wrap up our recap you know if, uh, it's hard to answer the question what one chart would I use to try to make sense of things because there are a lot of things at play right now uh, the the tenure yield makes sense the chart of gold ar arguably is an interesting one uh, but I think the one that I'll highlight today just is the uh, is the breadth picture. We've talked about breadth a lot recently. Yesterday, if you missed our show, we did a segment banking on breadth where we really dug into some of the breadth characteristics. We talked about bullish percent indexes and other things as well. But what I want to highlight today is just the fact that this most recent upswing uh, in the S&P 500 with the S&P and the NASDAQ making new all-time highs uh, end of June going into early July, that was confirmed by the advanced decline line also going to new highs, but only for the S&P 500. If we look at the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange, common stocks only, if we look at the mid cap index, if we look at the small cap index, none of those other three have actually confirmed this new high. Do you wanna know what the last time I've seen where that exact configuration happened? Higher highs in price, higher highs in the cumulative advanced decline, but lower highs in the other uh, breadth lines. February of 2020, it was right after, uh, right before that, major topping pattern, we saw that exhaustion in breadth. So something to look forward to see if the weaken, uh, weakening breadth characteristics lead to further downside potential. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with my guest, Mark Newton. We'll see you in a minute. everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets from a technical and behavioral perspective. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment on Friday's show. We would love to hear from you. We appreciate so much hearing your feedback on the show, on our host, on our guests, but especially questions that are coming up as you are analyzing your own charts. Shoot us an email with any questions that are coming up. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you. Hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email address, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our fantastic content from our great group of hosts, also fantastic guests like Mark Newton and many others. Go to stockchartstv.com to set up a free account. You can also watch on demand on all your mobile devices. Just search on your app store for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on my guest today, Mark Newton. Mark's the founder of ML Newton Advisors, based in the New York area. has been a, a frequent guest on the show. Always a pleasure, Mark to hear your point of view. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be back. So we're in a market environment that I've described in uh, often as sort of an indigestion phase, right? We had sort of the rally February, March, April, and now we're sort of in this rotational environment where the market pushes higher, but the leadership is sort of brought into question. You're starting us uh, thinking about technology. What are you seeing here? Well, what's interesting, Dave, is as you mentioned, you know, we're seeing a lot of deterioration in maybe some of the mid cap and small cap and, and equal weighted indices. Uh, but technology continues to be the biggest sector that I think U.S. investors want to concentrate on. Uh, in front of us is just a ratio chart of the RYT, which is the equal weighted technology ETF versus the equal weighted S&P, which is the RSP. Uh, I use these simply to strip out the effects of all the large caps on these sectors and on the market as a whole. And as you can see, you know, we did see some choppiness between uh, February and May of this year, but the broader trend still remains very much intact in this. And so given that technology is 26% of the S&P, you know, this is really seek to camouflage uh, the market at a time when you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces in what's happening, but it really has not affected the S&P nor the NASDAQ one bit thus far. And, and so 
you know, in the last month, we saw over half the sectors were down on the month when you look at the, the larger spider sector ETFs. Uh, but in general, S&P and NASDAQ have barely been down even one day. And so, you know, that just serves to, to really make investors realize that uh, the technology is still a very dominating force in this market and something to pay attention to. Your second chart, I think, really speaks to the leadership uh, environment we've had, right? We had the cyclicals leading dramatically in the first quarter into the second quarter. All of a sudden, that's changing. We have the FANG stocks sort of uh, reasserting their leadership role. Talk us through this chart. Yeah, we did. So I created a composite based on the Bloomberg FANG uh, ETF uh, index based on Bloomberg. And you see the top 10 stocks that make up technology and consumer discretionary. This managed to bottom exactly where it needed to in May. So we did not really break the long-term trend line. Since then, we've seen a real resurgence of large cap technology that's really carried this uh, back to new highs. Now, you look at the second part of the chart, the RSI has gotten uh, pretty overbought in, in recent days. And my thinking is that if yields uh, can bottom and we start to see you know, energy stabilize a little bit, then uh, you know, we very well could see a rotation back into value while growth might take uh, you know, a back seat near term just because technology has gotten so overdone. But until you see breaks of this larger red trend line in the FANG, uh, because these stocks all comprise so much of all our indices and ETFs, you know, it's going to be right to be long the broader U.S. indices and also be long technology. You know, it's so funny. I'm, I'm asked how, you know, how far could the market really go if it's just the FANG stocks really working? And the answer is quite far, apparently, right? It's, uh, it doesn't doesn't seem to be a problem, right? It's very, very difficult to fade the trend, at least in S&P and, and the Qs and this and that, when it, it's so tech dominated. And so that, that's a key message, yeah. Now, your last chart is really speaking to the relationship of small caps and large caps. Small caps have really been underperforming. Walk us through your take here. Right. So after one of the largest periods of outperformance we've seen in small caps in recent years, that being last November, really up until March, uh, we've seen small caps really start to turn down pretty sharply. And so, you know, I do think it might be a near term phenomenon, but for right now, small caps are certainly not the place to be. Uh, we saw rates peak out in March. We saw quite a few indices peak out, whether it be the value line geometric or, uh, you know, New York composite. Many of these indices have shown tops that occurred. Even the Dow Jones peaked out in May, uh, only made a, a brief move back up higher in June. But the key message here is that large cap remains the, the place to be for the time being and that we're seeing small caps under pressure. So for those managers that are picking style uh, for the time being small, which means that this group is still under a lot of pressure. So we only have about a minute left, Mark. It's three fantastic charts. When I'm looking at a chart of the S&P, we talked earlier about uh, you know, just the, the FANG stocks in a leadership role. We talked about the FANG index, obviously continue to push higher. It's hard to fade the market when that is continuing an uptrend. What would you see on the chart of the S&P 500 that would convince you that things are not as attractive, that the trend is no longer holding up? Is there a particular level or a particular signal that would convince you that this uptrend is really now brought into question? Yeah, for me, Dave, I'm looking at May lows. And so you mentioned, I believe, June, right around 4170. I'm looking at really 4056. And so if that's taken out for me on the S&P and for the NASDAQ, same thing. The Dow, I believe, under June lows, that would be significant in thinking not only is a longer term trend from last spring being violated, but we could start to see a real correction. Mark, it's awesome as always to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you and your family stay safe. Be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, sir. Take care. That's Mark Newton joining us from the New York area. Mark's the founder of ML Newton Advisors. Uh, I've known Mark and, and have followed his work for, for a long period of time. And what I love about how he described it, you can see the, the challenges I think we're facing, you know, looking at the markets and thinking about some of these leadership themes. How, how, how difficult is it for the market to go higher when the FANG stocks are doing so well? The answer is it's not hard at all, right? You can, you can see that even with weakness in cyclicals that, uh, that strengthen that index, uh, continues to uh, to keep the market uh, holding in there uh, in there just fine. Great take from Mark Newton. We need to continue on with our next segment, which is getting sentimental. A lot of the weekly sentiment data updates uh, Wednesday into Thursday. So we love to take a look at some of the sentiment data and see where it's at relative to the trend. And as we've talked about many times in the show, when I think about the big picture uh, in terms of the macro environment, it has three pieces, price and breadth 
and sentiment. And, and for me, it's that priority order. The, the number one thing, as my mentor, Ralph Eckenpore always told me, if you had one thing to look at, look at a chart of the S&P 500, I totally agree. So it starts with price. It starts with key levels and key trends and what the overall uh, market trend is. Step two for that, for that uh, to that for me is, uh, is the uh, breadth picture, right? What are the breadth or participation measures telling you about the individual names that make up those indexes? Are you seeing strength or weakness? And how does that compare to the trend? And then finally, is a measure of sentiment. What are investors saying? Well, how are they positioning themselves based on those first two items? And if you combine all three of those in a consistent way, I think I'll have a pretty good sense of what the environment is. Let's start with the VIX. So when I think about sentiment, volatility is obviously one of the key things uh, to, uh, to, to concern ourselves with. You know, look at, I'm struck as I was doing my monthly report for, uh, for my own clients uh, this week, I was looking at the trend in the VIX and just look at the long-term downtrend in the VIX from where we started in March of 2020, spiking to uh, you know a long, long-term highs in the 80s, back to where we're at right now. And just in the last 12 months, last eight to 12 months, you can see how this trend overall, while it's been relatively sideways for a while, it's really continuing to trend lower. We hit a bottom of the VIX around 15. That was the lowest level we'd seen since February of 2020. We hit that last week. And that actually, if you go back in time, is about mid-range to where we were in 2019. So before the market top in February 2020, before the huge spike in the VIX, this was about a mid-range value from where we were. So far, what I'm seeing is that apparently was one of the low levels that we may see in this uh, in this cycle because the uh, the VIX uh, quickly spiking up, nearing back up to uh, to 20. So overall, if you just look at the last uh, three months, for example, we're ranging between about 15 on the lower end, around 20 to 25 on the upper end, and now we've come off of the lower end of that range and now sort of uh, nearing back to the uh, to the upper end of that. So if you can see the last number of times that we've hit a VIX around 15, 16. Uh, or so we can see that those have been some of the actionable uh, tops, some of the pullback opportunities. So the fact that we're pulling back here as the VIX uh, bounces off of 15 is uh, is fairly reasonable. I'll, I will always remind you, this is not a 100% uh, perfect negative correlation between those two. That relationship is fluid, but overall makes sense that an increasing VIX, increasing volatility, increasing uncertainty usually means uh, a negative move for stocks. We're seeing that this week. The second chart in our sentiment pack is looking at the AAII survey. This is the American Association of Individual Investors. This is really weekly data on a, on a relatively small number of individual investors basically answering the question, are you bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks? And what's happened in the last week is we've come back down, actually. So we're just above 40% bulls. Last week, we were around 49% bulls. We were almost at that 50% level, which for me is how I, when I start to describe things as euphoric, is when we get the AAII bullish number above 50%. Because that tells you over half of respondents are now bullish on the market, or as we would anecdotally say, we are all bulled up. And the anecdotal last buyer has bought and who's left to push the price higher. If you look, though, we very quickly came back down. Now we're at 40, which is sort of in a healthy bullish range. So while the price trend has been uh, strong and arguably momentum indicators, as, uh, as my guest Mark Newton was showing earlier on the FANG stocks, while the momentum is a little overbought as the S&P and others, uh, other indexes have an RSI above 70, as the breadth picture is starting to be negative, the sentiment overall is still okay. I would, I would describe it as bullish, but not overextended. And that's what we see uh, right now with the, uh, with the AAII bullish number pulling back from 49 back to around 40. The next chart we have is looking at the name exposure index. This is the National Association of Individual, sorry, National Association of Active Investment Managers. It's a survey of money managers, and you have five answers. You can say I'm 200% long, 100% long, I'm 0% equities, I'm 100% short, 200% short, and the, the updates uh, fairly frequently. We can see that at times we've been have a, had a name exposure index above 100%, which basically tells you on average the money managers responding to the survey are leveraged long. They're over 100% long equities. Last week, it was about 95%. This week, it's coming back down uh, to just above 80%, around 82.50. So what that means overall is that money managers are participating, but not overly so. We're not overextended. We're not oversubscribed, not overbold up, or not all bold up on the, uh, on the market. So it's interesting, two of those key sentiment surveys are not giving you fourth levels. They're more mildly bullish. They're more actually in a healthy uh, bullish range. So for what it's worth, that's uh, that's what we're seeing. The RIDEX flows, which we refer to uh, usually every every Thursday, still remaining incredibly low. The scale is inverted to be more in line with what we see from the other sentiment data. So 0.08 is one of the lowest readings 
in the history of this uh, data series going back for a decade. So what that tells you is it's looking at the Ridex uh, mutual fund family and how uh, investors are allocating between you know, the different parts of that uh, of that uh, those funds. Are they in the more bullish funds or the more bearish or cash related funds? And right now, essentially, uh, investors are in the most bullish uh, structured funds that they uh, that they offered, and much more so than we've seen uh, historically. The last two charts we'll look at are looking at the put call ratios, and what's happened is the put call ratios are now coming back up after being at fairly low levels. If you look at where we were in uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, and earlier in June, we had fairly low levels for uh, the put call ratio. This is the totally total put call ratio, which bottomed out around 0.7 percent. That's similar to where we had been in previous cycles when we had a, a bit of an overextended market and pulled back a little bit. If you look at dollar sign CPCE, which is not looking at the index options, but just at looking at equity options, you can see we're actually mid range. The lowest point we were at was around 0.4. That was in early June. The, the, the last time we were that low was back in February and January, previous uh, pullback uh, moments or sort of short term peaks in the price. From there, we've actually rotated back higher and we're really mid range for where we've been in the uh, in the last year. So as I look at the sentiment data and I tell you that the market is overextended on a price and momentum basis, and I tell you the breadth configuration is more negative because we're seeing, seeing signs of divergence. When I look at the sentiment data for what it's worth and full disclosure, I'm not seeing anything that euphoric. I'm actually seeing fairly reasonable levels uh, in line with previous bull market cycles uh, that are in a, in a healthy range. It'll be interesting to see if we do see a bit of a further distribution, what ha happens to some of the sentiment data. Things like the AAII survey have been so bullish for so long because of this extended uptrend. It could be very quick for that, uh, for that survey to actually go down. It might be interesting to see if you finally get an increase in bearish respondents, which we've actually not seen increase very much in uh, quite a long time. We need to wrap today's show and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the equal weighted S&P. I love uh, Mark Newton's take on the overall environment. I, I can't disagree with the points that uh, he was making. I thought he laid out uh, the case very, uh, very, very well. This is a chart we look at often looking at uh, equal weighted versus cap weighted S&P. He was showing us the equal weighted versus cap weighted uh, in the, uh, in uh, uh, sorry, the equal weighted technology versus equal weighted S&P. Here we're looking at the equal weighted S&P versus the cap weighted S&P. You can see that this is trending lower. And what that tells you is basically the mid capper, uh, uh, smaller stocks within the S&P 500 are underperforming the mega caps. This speaks to the mega cap leadership. This speaks to the fact that a lot of uh, stocks within the index, especially the cyclicals are already rotating lower. And can the market go higher when this ratio is trending lower? Of course it can. The challenge I would have is how much can it go? How long in terms of time and price? And I would argue, I would speculate that that's limited upside overall. Chart number two is looking at growth versus value. This is the IWF versus the IWD. We can see that this is clearly rotated more to the growth side of the spectrum. We've talked about the weakness that we've seen in cyclical since mid-May, the improvement that we've seen on some of the, uh, uh, the growthy uh, names uh, the FANG stocks, Amazons, and others breaking out and continuing their uh, consistent uptrends. This ratio is not pausing anytime soon, even with a bit of a bounce in some of the energy stocks uh, today, overall clearly still favoring growth. And I would look for that to continue. However, it's interesting to note that the growth part of this, the numerator is overbought. If you look at technology, the, the denominator, the things like energy and others arguably oversold coming off of a, of a, of a little bit of a beaten down level. Finally, we have the chart of Amazon. We've highlighted this 10-month base and a breakout. You know, it's an interesting uh, bar today. Earlier today, it looked like we were going to just continue to drop, right? We had the big breakout day two days ago. We continued that upswing uh, yesterday. Today almost looked like a bit of a retracement, uh, looking back to see if we would get back to that breakout level. But Amazon rallied and finished in a position of strength up uh, almost 1% today. So overall, if I had one chart to sort of track this growth thesis and whether you will continue to see strength and growth, I would say a chart like Amazon breaking out of a 10-month base in a plain vanilla environment would seem very encouraging. That's the type of chart that I think would be reasonable to, uh, to expect to follow it, to follow that trend higher. A day like today sort of, uh, you know, sort of adds more and more comfort to that thesis of further strength and growth. However, it's overbought. So the question is, can it overtake that overbought condition or leverage that overbought condition to continue to push to new highs. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday for the final bar special. Thank you to Mark Newton joining us from New York. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.